Marty, thank you uh, so much for doing this. Um, I want to give people a sense of, of, in fact, why we're doing this, why we have uh, bringing in filmmakers and other artists to, to, to program a double feature. This is really a story that began when you were a little boy. Well, yes, that's the way I saw the films, despite having a 16-inch TV in the house in the late 40s. Where I 16 saw like, inches? 16 inches. That, that was big. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you know, you, you saw these films on TV, but primarily they took me to the movies. I had a terrible asthma, so they protected me from sports and from any running about and from any hysterical laughter because that could cause a spasm and you and they go to the hospital and that's the end. I'm not laughing at the asthma. I'm no, laughing. but you know what I'm saying? Right, right. It's a, yeah. that's, why, that's why I laugh all the time. Right, yeah. Also, but, the first movie you have, it was Blood on the Moon. It's yeah, not full it's of laughs. It's not that fun. No, it's yeah. fact, pretty scary. Yeah. But this is how we saw these things and we saw them usually in the second run. Mm -hmm. And the second run theaters had uh, double builds and often they were, they were films for... There was one genre, let's say, for um, maybe a musical or a, a Western, it's sort of a big one. And there were the B films on the second half of uh, the double bills. And there's some really inventive double bills, I must say. Because when you look at them on paper now and in the paper then, right, that's how you'd find out what was playing. Well, we'd see them and, and they were beautiful illustrations in the paper and you'd want to go and see this, you know, these two pictures together. So was there ever a time when you went to a double feature, when young Marty Scorsese went to a double feature, that you ever left after the first movie? No. No, first of all, you walked in the middle. And you saw whatever was coming on. You saw the end of whatever, the middle of the what end. Do you mean of you one... come in? You, again, you know, there start... was no or reserve. The only time you was not supposed to come in the middle of a film was Psycho. So you'd routinely, I mean, you might. Absolutely. For Blood on the Moon, might start at one. You might show up at oh, 137. Oh, it's at 137, yeah. And you watch that, and then you watch it over. Right. And you say, everybody says, this is where we came in. <laughs> and <laughs> then people are stumbling over the, people are making noise, getting in and out of the road. Right, because it's over for them. It's over for them, yeah. They're being ruining for everybody else. we <laughs> laughing. But that was the thing until Hitchcock did that number at the Mayfair Theater in New York. And I saw it the third night at midnight, Psycho. With the uh, command that you must With mustn't... the command and a wild audience, right. I can tell you. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I bet. So what uh, draws you now uh, to Blood on the Moon? Because Blood on the Moon with the uh, with a cast uh, led by Robert Mitchum, also Robert Preston. Yeah. Uh, what draws you to this movie? The thing about the film, and don't forget, I was six years old when I saw this. My parents uh, took me to see it. It's not a movie for six-year-olds. No. But, you know, they wanted to see One Touch of Venus, I guess, and there was a Western for the kid. Right. This film certainly was the first noir Western I saw. And there's a brooding nature to it. Musaraka shot it. It's influenced a lot of Killers of the Flower Moon in terms of the look, every coat, every hat. But what's happening with that film is I'm watching this thing and it's all underplayed. And as a young person, I was used to these B-Westerns in Technicolor, very enjoyable pictures with clear-cut heroes. Nobody seems to be a hero in this film, and everybody seems to be about to betray each other. Right, sure. And it's all sort of both shape, all very careful. You don't know where anybody stands until Robert Preston comes in, and he's so likable. Jim Gary! Hello, Tate. And then they're friends. So oh, here's something I could latch on to here as a kid. Ultimately, as the picture develops, there is a moment where there's a confrontation between the two, which results in a fist fight, unlike anything I had seen in movies up to that time, because the other fight scenes usually were, as my mother used to say, he gets hit in the head, he still has his hat on. It's no wonder <laughs> that they describe these fights as they're choreographed. Yeah. And they're like dances. They're like dances. Right. They are not what we know a barroom for all exactly. would be. Exactly. This is different. I'm watching this thing and the fight doesn't end tables are going you don't even see what's going on you just feel it you know and i was extremely upset from that after that fight scene i can't describe what happens in the film because i can't follow so throughout the movie it's not just because the plot's hard to follow but although the plot being hard to follow is not relevant in any right, way not, no. you, you, yeah right it's all mood right you're just trying to get an idea who the good guys are who the bad guys are or or, or who the kind of good guys are and the kind exactly. of bad guys are, <laughs> um so first you talk about preston and you talk about his likability and it's hard for me never having seen Preston as you did as a young boy, to me, it's Robert Preston from the music band. No, so this you guy, make, no, he was, he was totally different. Wonderful. Totally yeah. different, right. But Mitchum, immediately, when he comes on screen, there aren't many actors where you don't know which way they're gonna fall, right? Right. You did that effectively with DiCaprio. Yeah, Killers. a lot of my films, I'm attracted to those characters. I grew up around them. I would see people do crazy things, but they're actually very nice if you yeah, got to right. know them. And so, they were neither heroes nor villains. You know what I'm saying? Right. And so um, I kind of felt more comfortable 
with the with those characters and also want to know more about them. Uh, we'll take a look at the at the film shortly, but we ought to mention Robert Wise. Didn't want to do westerns. I think he made two or three I, I know. westerns in his yeah. career, but he knew how to make a western. Oh, yeah. yeah. But he took everything from Val Luton. Right. And I think that's one of the things that drew me in, that it had the mood and tone of a Val Luton B horror film, in and a way. And Musaraka had also shot. And he movies. shot Cat People. Yeah, and yeah, yeah that's right. exactly. So, Marty, great stuff. Thanks very much. Thank you. We'll talk after the film. Here it is from 1948 with a cast led by Robert Mitchum and Robert Preston. Blood on the Moon. Back here with uh, director uh, Martin Scorsese, who programmed our uh, double feature tonight, a double feature that you saw in 1948 mm-hmm. as a mm-hmm. young boy. So a long time, we don't know which way Mitchum's uh, going to fall. Yes, yeah, you like him, though. Oh, instantly. You, you like, like him. him. And this way, when he when he becomes nasty and difficult, as a young person, I found it very, very hard, you know. But ultimately, I, I sensed in him a decency. What surprised me about Preston was that he came on. Right. Uh, he came on as a terrific guy, and he's got all these great plans, and he was the worst of them. Yeah. Preston's got that great line. At the end, uh, you and me, we could have licked him. Yes. you always had a conscience breathing that's, down your neck. Right. That's what it was, and I didn't know what he meant. Right, right. You know, and I said, oh, they could have, but what's this conscience thing? <laughs> right. And, you know, and then in the beginning, we think that, that Tom Tully is the, probably yes. the bad guy, right? Yeah. He's given, yeah. he's given yeah. Mitchum's yeah. character, Jim Gary, such yeah. a hard time, and yeah. then... It turns out, no, if there's one really good person in the whole movie, that's right, it's him. And when Mitchum goes to tell Walter Brennan his son is dead, Brennan plays an angry man or a tough man. He's amazing. He goes, well, what do you want? And Mitchum tells him, and he just takes it. And Mitchum has a decency about him. That's what it is. Yeah. You talked about Mitchum's presence, this ability to command the screen. He's carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders, Mitchum, in that film, and all, all his films. All those films, really. I got to meet him a few times. He did a cameo for me in Cape Fear. But, you know, like Gregory Peck, the gunfighter, you know, oh, obviously yeah. Peck from the original Love Cape Peck. Fear with Mitchum, there was never a hint that Gregory Peck was anything other than a hero. And right. there was this constant mystery surrounding Mitchum. Constantly. And yet, again, because of, I think, you know, people around me when I was growing up and that sort of thing, I saw the hero in Shades of Grey. And uh, I found that when I started to tell stories... Um, these were the ones who uh, who, uh, who who led me into that direction, so to speak. Right. I'm going to go back to the idea of double feature. The movie we, we have coming up next, uh, Ava Gardner, Robert Walker, and One Touch of Venus. The way you've described seeing that movie, One Touch of Venus came first in the double bill. That no, you I, saw, or, I, or, or was so it? That was the top half of the double bill. Blood on the Moon was was a, uh, was the a B. B film. Was yeah. the B. Was the and that thrower. was shown first. We sat So we're showing first. them out of order tonight, yes. technically. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. By the way, do you have any of the, you, you have some of the ads. Yeah, right? I got some right here. I got some of these things. This is, and so you went, you didn't just remember these things, you went back into papers. Oh, yeah. I found stuff like here's the, you know, here's the black rose and the threat. Right, right. You know, Which is one of the film. ones you sent yeah. us. Yeah. Broken Arrow and Bunko Squad, which became a TV show with Reed Hadley, I think. Um, here's uh, The Big Lift and A Ticket to Tomahawk, which was a musical Western, which is really interesting. Wagon Master was the first John Ford film I saw, and it was playing with The Secret Fury, which you've been showing a lot. My brother took me to uh, Stromboli and uh, Follow Me Quietly. Follow Me Quietly, I believe, is Richard Fleischer. Stromboli was, how should I say, it seemed more in connection, of course, naturally, with the neorealist films I had seen on TV when I was five years old. Right. Marty, thanks for bringing the double features that were so important to you as a kid uh, to us. Yeah, you're uh, welcome. Let's get to the uh, second part of it. Uh, Coming up, uh, Ava Gardner and Robert Walker in One Touch of Venus. Next on TCM, One Touch of Venus, then violence. And later, summer of 42. TCM turns back the clock tonight. I'm joined by uh, director uh, Martin Scorsese. Uh, Marty, thank you for doing this. Uh, You're welcome. These uh, double features, uh, two for one, uh, two films programmed by one artist, one filmmaker in your case, sprung from your imagination based on your experiences uh, as a child, seeing yes, so yes. many double features. Yeah, because we only saw films in the second run, uh, and they were double features. Um, the first run were were on 42nd Street and Broadway and 49th Street and the big theaters. First and that all, would have been just one movie. Like one that, movie, right. beautiful projection, but you'd have to go uptown. We weren't allowed to as kids, and also it was too expensive for our parents to take us. 
So later on, I was able to do that by going to the Roxy and the Paramount, and I saw Vertigo in this division at the Capitol Theater. So we just saw Blood on the Moon with Robert Mitchum and Robert Preston, directed by Robert Wise. You paired it with One Touch of Venus. That's because that's what yeah. you saw back yeah. in 1948. Yeah. The big selling point of this film is Ava Gardner. Yes, yeah. yeah. It's certainly based on Greek myths, falling in love with the statue, the statue comes alive. For me, it introduced me to the Greek concept of beauty and the way they moved about the goddess, the right. goddess of beauty. But that began a whole um, obsession, which I still have, which is uh, pretty much of the ancient Greeks and Romans and that ancient world, the, uh, the idea of the quintessence of uh, beauty. What is beauty? Um, and that started with this movie. This movie has Robert Walker leading the cast. He's a window dresser at a fancy department store, and the owner has bought a $200,000 statue of Venus, which looks remarkably like Ava Amazing, Gardner. Like Ava Gardner, yeah. yeah. I don't think we're spoiling anything by saying <laughs> Robert Walker kisses the statue. <laughs> and, and she, it, comes, yes, she yes. comes to life. Was it you who kissed me? You're talking. You're alive. The way she plays with Robert Walker the way she smiles at him, yes, yes, the way she essentially says, was he keeps saying, you gotta go, go back. Yes. I got, Like she cannot figure out, she's like, why What's are you this? running away from me? So I literally invented this, <laughs> right, right? <laughs> this whole love thing, that's me. That's me, that's me. It's so yeah. wonderful. Yeah. It's a really sweet film. And um, a lot of it has to do too with Robert Walker. Yes, that's right. Uh, he yeah. has a gentleness and a sweetness to him that's yeah, that very moving. That gentleness really yeah. comes across. Yeah. There's also the presence in this movie, sort of unexpected to me, because she's always so funny, and she's very funny here, but Eve Arden. Eve Arden. Who plays yeah. the uh, assistant to the uh, department store owner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she does the thing here that I wanted to ask you about. She wears her glasses, and you'll see right away, and it goes through the whole movie. They're like this. Like the glasses are up above her temples, William A. Sider directed this. There's no way he said, hey, Eve, do this. She did that. Somebody yeah. like her. Yeah, Annie, right. She comes on like that. What are you yeah. going to say? Right. Um, <laughs> and they stay on, and they it stay works. stay on, it works. Yeah, I don't you know. know. Yeah. You expect that sort of thing from that kind of actor. Yeah, you know, right. you Give me something. Right. You know? Yeah. William Sider, he did some really, really interesting films, I think. I got to work with his grandson, Ted Griffin. He actually helped us a little bit on Wolf of Wall Street, actually. Really? Yeah. 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 So your tastes as a kid and into young adulthood, I mean, it really ran the gamut. I mean, you, you could talk about Italian neorealism as easily as you talk about this light, breezy musical. Oh, this musical. is a sweet film, yeah. Because this is, by the way, yeah. a musical. is about four or five times, mm -hmm. rather unexpectedly and inexplicably, yes. uh, where, <laughs> where they where they break in a song. But it was a Broadway show. From, from yeah. Kurt Vile did the Kurt music, Vial. but I, yeah. they, most of his music has been mm -hmm. redone mm -hmm. for the film. Uh, so is there any genre that doesn't, well, at first I had real problems with uh, Douglas Sirk. I was maybe 12 and Magnificent Obsession, really, I could not get through it. I did, I got through it, but it took me maybe 20 years to understand the theories in terms of irony. I was more for Borzaghi. Borzaghi's melodramas, that worked better for you then? I think they did. Yeah. So for a, a director like Sirk, you are representative of the overall film community on that. I mean, this is, a, he retired, right, after uh, Imitation of Life in 59. He well, moves time back to, to Europe. Love time to Die was pretty good. That right, but I mean, he's done with American films. He moves back to Europe, and then it takes 10 years for all of a sudden everybody to start recognizing maybe this guy was brilliant. Yes, yeah, yeah. and it took me a longer time. Yeah. Took me a longer time, and I love looking at the films now. I don't Russell Meddy and him together, yeah, oh, deadly duo. Jane Wyman, Rock Hudson, just extraordinary, you know. Uh, and and uh, the lavish use of um, uh, shadows and color, um, color gels. All of this for me uh, was extraordinary. All right, I could talk about this stuff uh, forever, <laughs> and I know they could listen to it forever. But uh, let's watch uh, the film that uh, we have next. One Touch uh, of Venus. Uh, here it is uh, uh, from 1948, cast led by the great Ava Gardner. This is One Touch of Venus. Back here with uh, director uh, Martin Scorsese, who programmed our uh, double feature tonight, a double feature that you saw in 1948 mm -hmm. as a mm -hmm. young boy. Uh, 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 Blood on the Moon and the film we just saw, One Touch of Venus with uh, Ava Gardner. I mean, you know, my initial reaction on seeing that ending where Ava shows up as a new employee and a new kid, she's, it's like 45 seconds. You know, where's purchasing? Uh, I don't care. Oh, you look yes. like somebody. Yeah, and they yeah, walk yeah, off yeah, together and wonderful. you know what's going to happen. Um, right, it felt at the time, I'm like, oh, come on. But then, as I've thought about it, since I'd not seen this movie until you 
uh, told us that this was the double feature you wanted to go with. I mean, I've told so many people the story about it that evidently it was the perfect ending. It really is. Yeah, right. Because the audience wanted them to be together. Right. In that and, way. You, right. Yeah. and you can't be with a goddess. She's got to go back. She's a goddess. To, she has to go back and do her things. Go, go, go back and do goddess things. Goddess things. Right. So your ability to recall titles, which by the way, I don't have, which is a very tough limitation of, since it's my job. But you... It's not just movie titles that you can come No, with. no, I could do it. It's just that at my age now, of course, I'm finding that it's a period of time from 1946 to, I don't know, 1995. After that, it's becoming kind of, I didn't find the interest enough in certain films. Oh, so you have a tougher years. time with stuff. Yeah, I'm not interested. 15 years ago. I'm not going to not... try, try to even remember. Just, right. you know. Because it wasn't. I carry around lists with me. So I, oh yes, I remember that film. I like that. Yeah, right. that sort of thing. But I'm, I'm also speaking about films that are not just American films. They're from all over the world now. So, you know, there's a film from Georgia and, uh, you know, um, uh, very difficult to pronounce the name of the director, but I liked it. Right. You know, that was the biggest thing that I learned when I came at, to TCM. And I thought I was 37 years old and I thought I knew a lot about classic movies and I learned very quickly. I had no nearly yeah. enough and you can never there's just an endless amount to learn but the biggest thing was this idea that the united states had some sort of monopoly on cinematic entertainment i know right I know. and you think and you just you were bred that way and of course i know there are good, there were good foreign films but then you start realizing that the germans and the english and the italians and the and indians the french, and the japanese and the french and the they all they all knew what they were doing. Yeah, they yeah. really did. Yeah. They really did. Now, of course, but I always tell the story that by 1980, up to 1980, if you want it, were interested in, in the history of film, you had, it was containable. Um, before the Eternal Library, let's say, all the films made before 1930 in America, I mean, up to 1940, let's say, all the films of the 30s, they were hardly available. And if they were, they were spliced up and scratchy and they looked like old movies. Right. And so you didn't really see them. So you, you, you They sent it. a message even to the audience that yeah. you shouldn't care about this because we don't. We care. don't care about right. it. Yeah. And so right around the late 30s, all the way up to the um, 1980, I'd say, in order to really understand a kind of sense of history of, of uh, filmmaking, it was you could contain the Hollywood films or films coming from America, also from England, some from France, pre-war and post-war. And, of course, um, only from Italy post-war. There was a whole industry before that, of course. Um, then the Japanese cinema started to come in. And it was all containable. Now, everything's right. available now, especially since Turner has, you know, um, uh, restored all these amazing movies and opened our eyes in the 90s, you know, to things like One Way Passage and Safe in Hell and Babyface. Come on. Baby, babyface. <laughs> but it's interesting when you talk about studying film, then, because what you first has to be that you get immersed in it something, emotionally. Yeah, right. something. That's Take what I mean in. about Magnificent yeah. Obsession. I couldn't. Yet I knew there was something there, but it took me years to follow. To figure know. it out. Uh, as we go, uh, Marty, I'm going to say one fairly mushy thing. I can't thank you enough on behalf of everybody at TCM for what you and, and, and Steven Spielberg and Paul Thomas Anderson have, uh, have done for us and, and represented the TCM fans so effectively. Uh, uh, thanks so much. We, we owe a lot to you. We appreciate it. I know. It's an honor. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Martin Scorsese, thank you so thank much. You. Uh, stay with us. The movies, of course, continue on TCM, uncut and commercial free. Next on TCM, violence. Then summer of 42 and later class of 44. Have a reunion with TCM tonight. <laughs>